I'd like to thank the organizers as is traditional, but especially, I know from Strings 1995, there's always one organizer who does all the work. And so I believe I should especially thank OFA for doing this here. But anyway, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Many of you have possibly heard me give some kind of broad overview talk on this subject, and I decided I'd try and do something of the opposite in this, time, in this talk and try and tell you a little bit more about exactly what we can do. And ultimately, this might make some points of contact with what we heard this morning. So basically, the outline of my talk is to actually talk about really finding microstate geometries and their holographic dictionary. And we're going to focus on a very specific set of family, family of D1, D5, P states, and then actually build their holographic jewels. And then we will find some very nice microstate geometries that have very long ADS2, BTZ throats. And we will also discuss um, how to duality transform some of these things into uh, holographic geometries for the uh, MSW string and perhaps some holographic jewels of MSW states. The, this is based on a series of collaborations with the sort of my, my good colleagues and collaborators over the years. Anyway, let me get started onto the meat of the thing. First of all, just a short introduction about what we're trying to do with microstate geometries. So microstate geometry is simply defined to be a smooth, horizonless solution to the bosonic sector of supergravity with the same asymptotic structure of infinity is a given black hole or black ring. It's supposed to be basically a soliton that looks to arbitrary approximation like a black hole. Okay, why supergravity? Because the goal is to make a resolution in the stringy theory at the horizon scale, not at some Planck scale, but some macroscopic scale, which means you have to use massless fields if you want to get very long range effects. And then the question comes, what can you do? And we focus typically on BPS because they're so much more computable time-independent, horizonless, smooth geometries on supergravity. And then the next question is, oops, what CFT states do they encode? Now, just a very quick, broad motivation of why we're doing this. First of all, we've, there's a sort of growing belief that resolving microstate black hole, sorry, resolving the black hole information problem seems to require microstate structure to be encoded and supported at the horizon scale. And if you have, want to have a theory of gravity there, Microstate geometry provides the only known mechanism that can do that at present. Supergravity, I believe, also is very important for another reason. The, if you think you've got microstate structure encoded at the horizon, then ba and you want to find some larger scale coherent effect of it, suppose you want to think about maybe it has some effect on LIGO or some accretion disk, there's some coherent effect of it, then the place you should look is in supergravity, or at least in gravity, and uh, try and find those coherent things in that thing. And then the last question, which is what I'm going to focus a bit more on today, is to what extent can you semi-classically encode microstate structure? OK, so there are two sort of standard CFT methods to get at the, uh, uh, the microstates of VPS black holes. I'll talk a lot more about the D1, D5 CFT as we go, but for the moment, it's just a 4-4 supersymmetric CFT with a very large central charge, N1 and N5, the number of D1s and D5 brains. The quarter BPS states are well known. They're just the Ramon Ramon ground states of this CFT. And the eighth BPS states are, the, um, are essentially any left moving state times the Ramon ground state. And this is the thing that 20 years ago, essentially, or 21 years ago, Strominger and Waffer did the state counting for in five dimensions and got the right answer. OK, the other one, oops, don't seem to be. Am I dead? There we go. Ah, good. The other one is the MSW string. This is a 0-4 supersymmetric CFT. It's an M5 brain rapid, given by an M5 brain. You wrap it around an ample device, or very ample device in Calabi Yau. The result, remaining two, 1 plus 1 dimensional piece is a string theory, or some kind of string, um, which defines a conformal field theory, which has a central charge given by taking the two, essentially the triple intersection of the uh, dual divisor class, dual the divisor class. And then the state counting for this gives you a state counting for black hole in four dimensions. And these are the two, well, there are, there are variations on this theme, but these are two of the standard ways of getting at the state count. One of the focuses of the microstate geometry program is to look at, these strongly, look at the strongly coupled uh, gravity jewels of these CFT states and to what extent you can replicate them within supergravity. And what I'm going to show is, in some sense, the technique I'm about to use will give you both picture, a picture of the states in D1, D5 and in MSW, at least to a limited extent. Okay, so getting down to the basics and reminding people 
something that's essentially 20 years old. What, we ha what we're thinking of is a D1, D5 system. We have, oh, we have, uh, oh dear. Right, we have a D1, D5 system, basically with the D5s wrapping a T4, or you can wrap around a net K3, it doesn't really matter. The D1s and D5s then have a common direction, usually called Y, and there's a transverse space time. And the CFT is given by all the open strings that run between the D1s and D5s and has a central charge 6, M1, N5. Now, the other thing that's important, there's a whole bunch of Ramon ground states, which are the quarter BPS states in this system. And essentially, the easiest and simplest one is you treat every one of these little loops separately, and you can give them all maximum, maximum spin on them with their fermion zero modes. And in particular, if you put them all the spins in all the same orientations, you get what's sometimes called the maximally rotating ground state, which has J left and J right on half, on half N, where N is... Gosh, I keep hitting the wrong button. Right. Half N, where N is basically the product of N1, N5. Okay, so that's the sort of standard Ramon Ramon ground state, and it's well known from many years that what the holographic jewel is. It goes back to, I think, to Luna, Luna Malacena and uh, Luna Mathur. And basically, it essentially corresponds to a supertube in the R4. It goes to a supertube in the R4, uh, transverse to the brains, and it describes a circle. And there's one sort of Fourier mode, if you like, that describes how it loops in that space time. And then when you back react it, it produces a stand, the standard sort of ADS3 cross S3 cross T4 holographic geometry. And it's a beautiful geometry to do this, and we know an awful lot of, um, about the details of holographic theory, which for quarter BPS states, thanks to the work of people like Skenderis and Taylor. Okay, but there's more things you can do. I just talked about the maximally rotating one. You can also start using the Orbifold in a non-trivial way. And so you can start twisting these loops together to form loops of an arbitrary length, and you can sort of take their spin and just then distribute it over the longer loop. And so this subscript K will indicate the length of the twisted sector loop I'm going to use. The other thing you can do is mess around with the fermion zero modes. And the thing to keep an eye on is another, another class of states I'll be using, which are these zero, zero strands, as they're called. They have no angular momentum at all. You've just lowered the angular momentum as much as you can. And so within, just within the D1, D5 system, there's an interesting class of states you can consider, which is essentially an arbitrary mixture of these guys, the original guys, and these guys. And those I'm going to focus on for this purpose of this talk. And there's going to be a parameter A and B that we'll talk about, which tells you roughly how many of each of these things you've got. Okay, so again, the holographic jewel of D1, D5s is a fairly well-known beast. And essentially, we know that... Oh, gosh, I keep... We keep the... Uh, we basically then have the original circular bit which corresponds to this, and then there's a profile function which you can think of as a fluctuating charge density, if you like, but there's a second Fourier coefficient that turns up with that momentum number that describes these guys. So, and then there's a sort of partitioning of the charge, the original radius relation of the supertube now enables you to partition basically Q1 and Q5 amongst this lot or this lot, and you get to choose. Okay, so that's the D1, D5 part of the story. On this, we want to add some momentum or angular momentum. We want to get into this sort of black hole regime, oh, black hole regime where we talk about uh, this sort of thing. And the momentum charge is given by simply loading up the left moving sector with whatever you like. And so the one thing we can do really well, we understand how to do, is this class of states. You keep as much as you like of the original plus plus strands, the things that are spinning, with a number n naught. And now you, we know how to load them up with an angular momentum charge, J minus 1. This comes from essentially one of the many, many current algebras you have lurking in here, all of which are, if you like, subgroups of the R symmetry group. And similarly, with L minus 1, J3 minus 1. The interesting thing about this operator is they commute with each other, so it's sort of intrinsically abelian. And now we've got that, the length of the strands here, and we can load them up with M of these and N of these. And this splitting of N1 and N5 can be, is reflected in the splitting of the strands in the picture. Okay, so now if you define the, quantum define the quantum numbers of this, then basically J left, the angular momentum, inherits a bit from here, the same amount A and A squared, so J left is equal to J right, that's the vestigial remnant of that. But as you start loading this thing up, that quantum number, I think I've got this actually animated, yes, the, that guy gives you some angular momentum in the left moving sector, and it gives you some momentum charge. 
And similarly, this guy, which is what we're going to focus on, is perhaps the most interesting. It only gives you pure momentum charge. It turns up here. So basically, if you turn off the, um, the J minus 1 excitations, you basically have the vestigial remnants of that and some pure momentum. And then again, remember, A and B reflect how much of this versus how much of that. And this relationship is basically this relationship. OK. And I even said this, that this is the residue of the underlying D1, D5 state. And the really interesting case I want to focus on is when you add pure momentum, no extra angular momentum. And you can take this system and these states, and you can make the angular momentum as small as you please by killing these guys off and not turning on any of these. And these are the interesting geometries. OK, so here's what we can do. We know exactly how to do. It's called the supergraviton gas. I think that was due to Jan de Boer, who studied it some years back. But basically, it's essentially any linear superposition of states of this form the original strands with some number of them, and any number of these strands with any number of those excitations. OK, the holographic jewels. It's relatively easy to see what to do with these. You add momentum and angular momentum to the profile. So we start with this. This is the D1, D5 configuration. And there are three angles that are going to play a role. There's the angle on the ADS3, and there's the two angles on the three sphere. And the goal is to get that angular momentum structure of that state. So you've got three mode numbers in supergravity to mess around with. The V circle is the one here, so that carries essentially the momentum. And then you have the um, ang two angular momentum modes sitting there. So you can track exactly what happens. I've highlighted this with all these colors. The K here, the K here controls these modes and the vestigial remnant of the uh, uh, original piece of the string, also super tube, and they have a little bit of angular momentum in the space. The next mode is the mode in the M mode. It's this guy here. It contributes to the momentum. It contributes to the angular momentum. And it turns up here and here as a result, or here and here as a result. And as I said, the last mode, which is of interest, is the pure momentum mode. It's this guy. It turns up in the momentum charge. But it, and it also just turns up purely in the ADS space. So this is the obvious guess. You just check where the charges come from, and then you check that it actually works by looking at one-point functions. But this is the correct dictionary. You turn on those excitations, you know what they are. OK, so how do we actually build the geometry? It's actually not, well, technically it's quite, a bit, quite complicated, but the basics are very simple. The starting point is essentially we're compactifying 2B on T4. We are um, basically reducing to six dimensions. And then this was solved some time ago as to what the BPS form of the metric looks like. And it's relatively easy to see what it is. There are four coordinate, five co six coordinates, but one of them's kind of boring. That's the time coordinate. Everything's independent of that because that's its BPS and therefore time translation invariant. Then the other interesting things are the V psi and phi is an altissimal angle in here. Um, but basically the cartoon is this. You have an R3. You have an R3. And then you have two circle vibrations, one here and one here over that R3. And the topology is determined by where these things pinch off in the R3 base. And we'll keep the topology very simple. It's just going to be an S3 by the time we're done here. The scale of everything is set by warp factors, Ps and Vs and Z3s. But it turns out that essentially they all appear in the electric and magnetic parts of the thing. So in this particular ansatz, you have a whole collection of electric potentials and their corresponding magnetic joules, and they basically appear there. But then quadratic forms and cubics and so forth typically turn up in the metric, and they're there. So, so basically, the geometry and the topology is set by the vibration, and then the actual sizes of stuff are set by the electrostatic potentials and so forth. OK, now the BPS equations. The purpose of talking about this is to highlight their structure rather than the details. The first part is the electromagnetic part of this is really, really straightforward. It's all homogeneous and, most importantly, a linear system. That's key to doing what we do. But anyway, it says that the, the magnetic bits are self-dual and the electric bits are related to magnetic bits in a very particular way. But the important point is it's a homogeneous linear system. And these potentials and magnetic fluxes depend on every single coordinate you've got except you. And we will focus on particularly the Fourier modes. And thanks to Masaki Shigemori, the general solution to this for the two-center situation is known and understood. OK, the second equation is where things get harder. 
But the other really important point is it's, again, a linear system. It's inhomogeneous. And what we're working here is with the angular momentum vector and the momentum charge. And essentially, they are all determined by sort of some kind of electric cross-magnetic interaction in a non-trivial way. But again, everything depends on everything, all, all five coordinates. And in particular, we're going to focus on Fourier modes in exactly this way. And for this system, there are interesting families that are known, but the general solution is not known. OK, now, why is linear system important? Because if you want to build a completely generic superposition of these states and have confidence in what you're doing as the correct holographic dictionary, the beautiful thing about the supergravity system is you can superpose the modes in supergravity. And then you can just check how the details exactly work. But basically, you get all possible linear superpositions of all possible states like that. Now, we haven't done the general problem. But I want to focus on one very particular and interesting family. It's the one that I sort of advertised from the beginning. All I'm going to do is lo oh, load up the state with pure momentum charge to some power n on a strand. I'm going to keep it simple. Everything's strands of length 1. So everything splits in a very simple way between the 0, 0 sector and the uh, plus, plus sector. Now, again, we have this freedom of choice as how we distribute the electric charge amongst the zero, zero sector, sorry, the, one, the half, half sector and the zero, zero sector. And you should think of this as the residue of the previous D1, D5 brains, and this is where all the momentum excitations are going to be. And you can make the, char you can make the momentum charge arbitrarily large, and you can make the angular momentum arbitrarily small. So here's the geometry. And this is really a remarkably beautiful and, I think, very useful geometry. I'll explain a bit more later. So it starts off, like any good black hole, in flat space. As you approach the black hole, you start seeing the ADS3 cross S3 structure. And so you get this nice holographic background, or nice background, which you can do holography on the ADS3 cross S3 and invoke all the stuff I've just said. But because you've got a momentum charge, this thing then transitions to a BTZ geometry. And basically, here's the standard BTZ. It becomes BTZ cross S3, but it's the standard BTZ metric. But basically, for large rho, this is irrelevant, and this is ADS3. But for small rho, this now stabilizes the circle size, and you're actually in ADS2 geometry, and that circle size is controlled by the momentum charge. So the more momentum charge you have, the quicker this thing stabilizes, and the longer the ADS2 ADS throat, or BTZ throat, which is roughly speaking ADS2 cross S1. And then you go all the way down to the bottom of the throat, and you encounter the stuff that made it. This is where there's a, there's a nice little bump. And that bump is the sort of vestigial remnant of or the remnant of what made it, which is where the momentum excitations localize. And that causes also the transition over. Oh, boy, I'm going to kill this thing. Um, this causes the transition over to a smooth cap. And as I say, you can dial A to be as small as you like, and that turns J left and J right to zero, and the depth of the ADS throws as far as you like, or deep as you like. So what have we done here? We've got the first deep scaling microstate geometries with arbitrarily small angular momentum. That's an achievement we hadn't managed to get in this whole microstate geometry program. We generically had things with large angular momentum somewhere. Um, it goes to BTZ. It's deep in scaling, arbitrarily large redshifts, but it caps off smoothly. The momentum excitations localized at the bottom of the throat. The other thing not to forget is we have a holographic dictionary for ADS2, so ADS3 that tells us about states in a deep ADS2 cross BTZ throat, or BTZ throat. And the geometry of these states is dual to some of the states counted by Strominger and Waffer. I just want to, oops, let's go forward. Let me, before I do that, um, I also want to remark based on this morning, this is very much, this region here is governed by what is called near ADS2 um, geometry. What's happening here is this ADS2, this, the circle size is really the dilaton that Juan was talking, uh, not Juan, um, Douglas was talking about this morning. Okay, going forwards. What I want to do is now transition this stuff across to um, the MSW story. And so, again, what we're looking at, what we're looking at here is something which depends on r and theta in non-trivial ways, and in principle on every single phase in the problem. So the standard way to go down to five dimensions is really rather boring, because you've got to set m and n to 0 to go down on the v-fiber. 
But that's a disaster because if you do that, you're killing every single interesting excitation you're turning on. However, there's a beautiful thing in this solution. If you look at k equals 2m, those modes are, in fact, independent of the hot fiber on the S3. So you can go down on the hot fiber of the S3, and you can then get a nice microstate geometry, which is dual to a cap BTZ cross S2. I can explain that in a little bit more detail. But there's a little trick you want to do first, because you really want a three-charge uh, or three M5 brain charge thing at the end. And there's a trick which involves just a technical addition to the um, D1, D5 thing. thing. You can actually relatively easily add a KK monopole dipole charge. I don't, never know how to say it. KK dipole charge. Monopole dipole sounds rather strange. OK. Anyway, you can add, by orbifolding, you can add an arbitrary KKM charge to this thing. And then you do that, and you get this geometry. So this is the D1, D5. I overfold and I get another KKM charge. And then you do what the standard thing that you do with three T dualities. It takes you, first of all, you T dualize this, so these become D4 or D4s. This, you T dualize on this circle, and then basically the KKM becomes an NS5. And then, of course, you uplift in the sort of standard way, and lo and behold, you're an M theory, and what you've got is these have turned into M5s, 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 and this has turned into M5 as well. One of the important things to watch is this circle, the five circle. This is the one where we're going to add momentum, and it hasn't participated at all in this set of T dualities, and so we can do whatever we did before without messing it up with the T dualities. So anyway, this geometry goes straight over to M5, 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 so we're getting closer to MSW. Um, what's happened is that the D1, D5 KK monopole has gone to three M5 range charges, and in particular, um, Basically, the dualities, the other thing that's also important in this transition with the dualities and the compactification of the side direction, we've killed some of the supersymmetries, and it makes it 0, 4, as it should be for the MSW theory. OK, so now we add the momentum charge. It was here, and it, it was completely unaffected by this transition. And so now we have something that looks very much like the MSW string, but not quite. We're not quite there yet. Um, so MSW, if you remember, is a single M5 brain wrapped on an extremely complicated divisor in Calabi R3. And here I've got multiple disjoint M brains on T4s and T6s. Two important points. First, which is the, the fact that we um, have non-trivial fluctuations turned on on the Kähler deformations of the tori. So in fact, it tends to tilt some of the brains around, and these M5 brains actually start to bend into one another. But here's the real argument that means that this is absolutely the MSW thing. We've reduced the whole thing to five dimensions. And so our solution is valid for any Calabi-Yau compactification with the same set of M5 brain charges. It's the universality of the five-dimensional solution that tells us this is uh, valid for the MSW string. So what does it look like? It's basically the previous picture compactified on S1. It goes to flat space, R31 cross S1. Then it makes a transition to ADS3 cross S2. That's the, the, we've lost the circle there. And then BTZ cross S2. Same picture, just one dimension less. The other thing is we've had to kill one of the fluctuations. We had to put k equals 2m, but we still got two on the go. We got something which is a momentum mode and something which looks like an angular momentum mode in the space-time. So we got two, at least two quantum numbers turned on with arbitrary um, Fourier coefficients. And it's a deep scaling, it must be, this must be some kind of deep scaling microstate geometry for momentum excitations of the MSW string. But there's another bonus in this story. There was a long effort after the MSW string to do um, deconstruction and try and implement some kind of procedure of deconstruction by turning on uh, perturbative D0 brains or perturbative momentum in a deconstructed MSW string background. Well, basically, this is the right answer. This is a precise, fully back-reacted, capped-off BTZ cross S22 realization of deconstructed configurations. And it's basically t dual to a whole bunch of D1, D5, P microstates. So let me finish the basic story. I have, we now have explicit microstate geometries that are holographic duals to very precise families of D1, D5, P CFT states. This is what I said before, but let me emphasize, this is the first deep scaling microstate geometry in the black hole regime where you have no angular momentum, or essentially h bar of angular momentum when you're done. Um, it produces BTZ, BTZ throats. 
either S cross S2 or S3. And I think this is really interesting. You have a long region where the, where the circle is stabilized, and therefore it really is realizing some kind of near ADS2 gravity, uh, where, the, where the size of the circle is playing the role of the dilaton. Um, the men momentum excitations always localize at the bottom of the throat, and, create, and then once you go through them, they create the smooth cap. We also have exact knowledge of what the holographic states are that are creating this from the ADS-3, at least, if not from the, ADS, uh, from the point of view of CFT-1, we don't know. Okay, and these are microstate geometries uh, that also represent um, states, presumably, of MSW, and that fully realize the whole deconstruction idea in this context. Finally, it's sort of more philosophical, and you know, maybe I'll get into trouble for this, but what I started trying to say that microstate geometries should capture the sort of universal large-scale gravitational effects of whatever microstate structure you try and line up at the horizon. And so in this talk, basically I've shown you that you can, you can get MSW, you can get D1, D5P, and while I haven't talked about what deconstruction is exactly, it does realize the deconstruction story. And going back, there's even direct connections between what we've been doing and Frederick Deneff's quiver quantum mechanics. So, in a sense, what I'm doing here is giving you sort of a universal gravitational picture of what microstate structure does on large coherent scales. There are many open issues in this game. First of all, um, the one thing we haven't got, the one thing that we really need if we're going to try and do this semi-classically, are the twisted sector excitations. Um, those are the things where most of the entry of a black hole lies. We've got some early results on doing, inserting orbifold twists and looking at modes and orbifold twisted things. But we really think that most of this, the multi-centered geometries are things that are going to be most directly related to twisted sectors. And we don't know quite how to do holographic dictionaries for multi-centered geometries, though that's another thing we're working on. Um, holography. We don't know much about the MSW theory. In terms, of, There's no weak coupling. There's no symmetric orbifold description. But we have now. Um, geometric states that should be dual to states of the MSW string. So it'd be kind of nice to know what, how you might describe them intrinsically in terms of the MSW formulation. And the last thing which I think is really going to be interesting is that we've now got these geometries, this last point here, that are extremely nice. They start off at least from ADS3 to ADS2 down to the cap at the bottom of the throat. We can actually probe these geometries. It turns out that there are some remarkably simpl remarkable simplification properties of these geometries that enable us to start looking at scattering, if not trying to evolve Green's functions. So therefore, we should be able to see how boundary to bulk correlators behave in this geometry. But I think that's really, hopefully, an exciting new uh, direction that, that might make some contact with the discussion this morning. And I'll leave it at that. Questions? Hey, uh, so there's a general theorem in statistical mechanics that says that if you take uh, any correlation function, mm -hmm. any observable, and you average it over the Hilbert space using the Haar measure, uh, mm -hmm. you get an answer that's exponentially close to the uh, microcanonical average, and therefore one by n close to the canonical average. Right. Uh, so do you have an understanding of how if you took generic superpositions of these geometries, uh, you would get an answer that was exponentially close to the usual black hole? So you're, 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 you're looking for these exponentially small gaps between the states and things like that? Uh, well, I'm just saying that if you take the, a superposition, a generic superposition right. of all of these geometries, uh, which is in fact the generic state in the Hilbert space, you should get something that's exponentially close to the usual black hole that doesn't have these features. Exponentially close? Oh, you mean when you thermalize on some form? Or uh, for example, if you measure the two-point correlation function yeah, okay. in, in so, the geometry. So, uh, so yeah. I, I, there's a sort of half assed thing I could do in that direction, which is essentially take a bunch. We've got a zoo of these geometries. I could calculate, calculate the same bulk to boundary correlator in those geometries and then average over all the ones and see what I get for that correlator. That might go closer to what, what you're expecting. But there's another possibility, which is when it has to do with this correlation function story. We want to know what happens when you, when, when you ping the stuff at the deep, deep interior, because that's where it'll start exciting the interior states. So in fact, one of the toy calculations I want to do is I want to drop a string into this geometry and then see how it excites the string and then start seeing how it might dissipate. But the, the other side of this is um, there are lots and lots of these guys that we can mess with. And I hope that, you know, what, what do you, where do you expect to see this sort of exponential 
difference between states is when the energy starts going into interesting mixed states between, these, between the different sectors. When you turn on the gravitational, um, turn on gravity, it's supposed to turn on a twist, very, uh, the twist uh, insertion in the conformal field theory. And that thing will then start mixing all, any excitation you make into all the different twisted sectors. So what we're trying to do now is also look at how that twist operator actually will give us a superposition of all the modes we've turned on. And in particular, there's that one mode called K, which is the length of the twisted loop. And so by averaging over that, I hope we'll see the effects you want to see. <laughs>